Welcome back! Today I'm going to be looking at one of Shakespeare's history plays, Henry VIII, which is something of an outlier in the Shakespeare canon. It's one of Shakespeare's later plays, and probably co-written with Fletcher, and it has a few aspects about it that make it a little different from some of Shakespeare's other plays. First of all, it's very ceremonial. There are lots of big, elaborate parades and ceremonies, including most notably the coronation of the Queen. And with it, it has more stage directions than are usual in a Shakespeare play. Sometimes modern editions will actually add stage directions to a Shakespeare play that are implied by the conversation and action. But this one was rather detailed in its stage direction and in its description of how the ceremonies were supposed to play out on the stage. It's also one that many fans of Shakespeare wrestle with because the plot seems to have odd tensions within it. At first glance, it feels as though the first half and the second half are at odds with each other. We definitely sympathize with the Queen, Catherine, at the beginning of the play, and throughout the play as we see her. But by the end, we're supposed to be celebrating the birth of Elizabeth, not Catherine's daughter. And this means we have to, in some way, come to terms with the fact that Catherine's rival is the one that rises to power in this play. There's also the conflict with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Cranmer, by the end of the play, which feels as though it kind of comes out of nowhere. And so, because it's difficult to know which characters we should sympathize with and like, and it's also difficult to follow the overarching plot arc, or even see if there is one, there are many people who dismiss this play or dislike this play. It's also a little bit odd because Shakespeare is dealing with historical figures that are very near the present, and each one of them had a huge impact on the world that Shakespeare is living in and writing in. And so the play in some ways is walking an interesting balance. Although this play is written in the reign of King James, it's still the royal family we're talking about. And so Shakespeare's treatment of characters was definitely walking a narrow line. He definitely could have rustled some feathers because there were political implications from this play that still had a huge impact on the world that he lived in. There are a lot of very minor characters or characters who are sort of in the background of this play who are going to have a huge impact in the next few years. And when they are referenced, you know his audience was thinking about the kind of impact that they were going to have. This wasn't the only play that Shakespeare participated in that was set in the reign of Henry VIII. In fact, uh, Sir Thomas More is another play that deals with some of the same characters and some of the same conflict, but from a different angle. Sir Thomas More is especially interesting because it's a play that may never have been performed, and its manuscript allows us to, to open up the world of censorship in Shakespeare's day. It appears that they weren't even allowed to use the name Henry VIII, but instead called him the King throughout the entire play. Fans of history will, of course, recognize as places where Shakespeare takes liberties with his characters and plot. The fall of Cardinal Wolsey in this play, for instance, is not historically accurate, but rather played up as a dramatic conclusion to what we see of Wolsey throughout the play. But in spite of its complexities and faults, this play is still pretty fascinating. There are a lot of really great characters, particularly Queen Catherine. And although some people may not be satisfied with the way the plot goes ultimately, there are a lot of great moments throughout the story that are so true to life and experience. The political intrigue in the first half of the book feels so real that I could envision certain politicians I'm familiar with in these particular roles. As I was rereading it this time, I felt I saw the doppelgangers of Buckingham and Cardinal Wolsey as politicians in my own government. There may have been no beheadings in my government in the last few years, but the grift and the backstabbing and the manipulation were all definitely there. And the more time I spent with this play, the more I did see an overarching kind of pattern throughout it. It's a pattern of rising and falling. We have the fall of Buckingham near the beginning. We have the fall of Catherine. We have the fall of Cardinal Wolsey. And then we have Cranmer being rescued from a fall, which sets up the political events of the next few years. We also have perhaps ironic references to Mary and to Sir Thomas More. 
and even maybe Cranmer, who are all ultimately going to fall, though not part of the action of this play. And so in some ways it is a repeated pattern of a tragedy, while ultimately ending with a sense of hope for the future that hope being found in Queen Elizabeth and ultimately King James. The fact that Cranmer does not fall but is rescued from a fall by the end of this play allows there to be a change in the trajectory. We're shifting from a political engine that keeps destroying its own to ultimately a more hopeful future. One more quick note is the prologue and the epilogue, which we often see in Shakespeare's plays and in some of the history plays we've seen them as well. In this one it's interesting because the title of the play is not actually Henry VIII, although that's what we usually call it now, but All is True. But in the prologue and epilogue he talks about how this is the truth. This isn't just a bunch of joking around, this isn't just a bunch of jibes, this is the, the truth. And so maybe he's sort of tapping into a recognition of uh, where we are in our history right now. As opposed to some of the much older histories, like the, the King John or the, uh, the Henriad, he's talking about the current history and how they've come to be where they are through somewhat tumultuous times, through the religious wars of the last few monarchs. Ultimately, it's a, it's a hopeful vision of the future of England, thanks to their current benevolent monarchs. So let's look at the plot of this story and how it plays out. The play opens with the Duke of Buckingham, who has recently recovered from an illness, an ague, and he is talking with some of his friends about the campaign in France that was led by Cardinal Wolsey. And Buckingham becomes more and more frustrated with Cardinal Wolsey, who he sees as a traitor, someone who is selling out his country and his country's interests for his own political gain. He's used this conflict with France to increase his power and to increase his wealth. And Buckingham decides that he's going to approach the king and expose Wolsey as a traitor. But before Buckingham can do anything, he is arrested because Wolsey has accused Buckingham of treachery, of speaking against the king and of attempting to seize power. Most of the evidence is based on hearsay from people who don't like Buckingham, but we'll see how that goes in the future. Buckingham has a family history that haunts him here. His father was the Buckingham in Richard III, who betrayed Richard and then was executed. But when Henry VII, Henry VIII's father, rose to power and defeated Richard, he gave this Buckingham back the dukedom. However, this is going to be the end of the line for the Buckinghams, thanks to the machinations of Cardinal Wolsey. We shift in scene two to the king speaking with Catherine and Wolsey. And Catherine comes before him as a suppliant and kneels down and asks for a pardon for all the people who are being heavily taxed by Cardinal Wolsey. The king didn't know anything about it, but Cardinal Wolsey has been wrecking the economy and crushing the people in order to give himself power and to fund the war with France, which again Cardinal Wolsey is using to elevate himself. The king didn't know anything about this tax, and he issues a pardon to all the people, which Cardinal Wolsey then twists around quietly and tells his men to spread the message that he was the one that was pleading on behalf of the people and changed the king's mind about the tax. Catherine also pleads for Buckingham, who is a good man. And she points out that some of the people that are accusing him are actually just people who are holding grudges against him for past arguments. However, Wolsey presents all of this mountain of evidence of things that Buckingham has said in the past that hint at his desire for treason, and his surveyor who hates him is lays out all of these things that he heard Buckingham say. And the king is so enraged by all of this that he has Buckingham tried for treason. In C3 we shift over to several of the courtiers who are talking about the conflict with France and how much the French culture is rubbing off on the English court. And primarily throughout this we see the influence of Cardinal Wolsey, the way he has gained so much power and influence in the court. And he's about to throw a big party that they all decide to go to. We see Cardinal Wolsey not as much of a religious man, but rather as a politician who is pulling all kinds of strings to gain himself power and wealth. 
In scene four, we see the party of the Cardinal, and we have several of the ladies and the gentlemen, and there's lots and lots of flirting going on. Lots of commentary on the beauty of the ladies, and the dancing and kissing and that sort of thing. And then the king comes in disguised as a shepherd with a bunch of his buddies, and they all pretend like they speak French and not English. In some ways, it's kind of like the Love's Labor's Lost scene. It's all courtly manners and silliness and frivolity. And in this scene, the king runs into Anne Boleyn, with whom he dances, and then at the end of the dance, he courteously gives her a kiss. But he's clearly very, very attracted to her. And so at the end of this scene of frivolity and flirting, we come to the end of Act 1, and we shift to Act 2. Act 2 begins with the aftermath of the Buckingham trial. Buckingham is being led away to be executed, and we hear about the trial from some gentlemen who come to see. There's lots of sympathy for Buckingham because everyone likes Buckingham. And Buckingham comes and makes a final statement to everyone, wherein he accepts his fate and he forgives those who have wronged him, though he wishes they had been a bit more Christian, particularly Cardinal Wolsey. He also remembers his father and the events of Richard III, and although he was risen back to power, now he's fallen back again. We see this sort of rise and fall. As he walks away, he gives his friends counsel, and he says, Where you are liberal of your loves and counsels, be sure you be not loose. For those you make friends and give your hearts to, when they once perceive the least rubs in your fortunes, fall away like water from you, never found again, but where they mean to sink you. All good people, pray for me. I must now forsake you. The last hour of my long, weary life is come upon me. Farewell. And when you would say something that is sad, speak how I fell. It's the stuff of tragedy, and everyone's very sorry to see Buckingham killed. He's a good guy. And it's especially frustrating because Wolsey is clearly not a good guy. He's clearly manipulating the king, he is messing with the economy, he is selling out the country, and all to line his own pockets. So frustrating when a bad guy is winning. But after Buckingham goes away, a couple of the gentlemen reference a rumor that the king has turned on Catherine, the queen. We've already seen her as an incredibly noble and honorable woman when she made her powerful plea for Buckingham. And we also remember the way Henry was flirting with Anne Boleyn. It just, again, doesn't feel right. In scene two of Act Two, we see the Lord Chamberlain, who is very frustrated with the abuses of Cardinal Wolsey, and he talks about this with Norfolk and Suffolk. They also see that Cardinal Wolsey is the one who has been nudging the king to turn on Catherine. Now, why he's turning on Catherine is complicated. Catherine was previously married to his brother. And if we look at something like Hamlet, where we feel the almost incestuous relationship between Claudius and Gertrude, it is the same relationship. It is a brother-in-law marrying a sister-in-law after the death of a husband. And so there were some taboos here. But their marriage has been legitimized for years, and Catherine is clearly a very good queen. But she hasn't produced an heir. And Henry is feeling the weight of this. So why is Henry turning on Catherine? There are three answers to this question. One, he's seen Anne Boleyn and he is infatuated with her. And so he wants to throw away his current wife for a new one. That's the harshest, most crass answer. And it appears to be pretty legitimate. There's also the king's worry about his heir. If he doesn't have a son, then who's going to carry on his throne? However, the answer that is most put forth by Henry and Cardinal Wolsey is the potential illegitimacy of the relationship between Catherine and Henry, thanks to the fact that she used to be his sister-in-law. And so Henry has suddenly been struck in his conscience. How much his conscience is being fed by his desire for an heir and his infatuation with Anne is unclear but we certainly feel it. He's definitely already met Anne, and he's definitely fretting about his heir. He does conflate, to some extent, the illegitimacy of his marriage with his lack of an heir as a judgment of God. Maybe God didn't give me an heir because I married my sister-in-law. And so when we see him in this scene, he is troubled in mind and angry, and he yells at Norfolk and Suffolk for interrupting him. But when Cardinal Wolsey comes in, 
he's glad to welcome in Cardinal Wolsey, because Cardinal Wolsey has gotten so close to the king and is basically pulling all the strings right now. This is also frustrating because Cardinal Wolsey has control over who the king likes and dislikes. Wolsey, for instance, sent away people who were sympathetic to Buckingham, leaving Buckingham without a lot of defense in the trial. And Wolsey is pulling in people who are sympathetic to pushing the king into a divorce with Catherine. Because Wolsey wants the king to marry the Princess of France, and so that he can further extend his power and use the foreign policy and affairs to increase his own power and gain again. However, the king has a different idea about who he's going to marry. And in scene three of Act Two, we see Anne and an old lady talking about the woes of poor Queen Catherine. And Anne is so sympathetic to the queen. But the old lady, who's a bit more crass, says, Oh, I bet this will give you a chance to rise to power. You'd want to be queen, wouldn't you? And Anne's like, no, I would never want to be queen, never. And then all of a sudden the Lord Chamberlain comes in and tells how the king has really been uh, impressed with Anne and is giving her this big allowance and made her a marchioness, to which the old lady is like, you know, winking and nudging her in the ribs. And Anne is trying to act all sad for Catherine, but she's being flooded with gifts all of a sudden and favors from the king. Yeah, you know where that's going. In scene four, we see Catherine being called up to trial before the king in order to work all of this illegitimate marriage thing out. But Catherine is very smart, and as soon as she sees that it's Cardinal Wolsey and his cronies who are pulling the strings here, who are the ones who are trying to officiate this trial, she knows that they are her enemies. She comes and kneels before the king and says, look, I've done everything to be the perfect queen that I possibly could. Why are you turning on me? Sir, I desire you do me right and justice and to bestow your pity on me, for I am a most poor woman and a stranger, born out of your dominions, having here no judge indifferent, nor no more assurance of equal friendship and proceeding. Alas, sir, in what have I offended you? What cause hath my behavior given to your displeasure, that thus you should proceed to put me off, and take your good grace from me? Heaven witness I have been to you a true and humble wife, at all times to your will conformable, ever in fear to kindle your dislike, yea, subject to your countenance, glad or sorry as I saw it inclined. When was the hour I have ever contradicted your desire, or made it not mine too? Or which of your friends have I not strove to love, although I knew he were mine enemy? What friend of mine that had to him derived your anger did I continue in my liking? Nay, gave notice he was from thence discharged. Sir, call to mind that I have been your wife in this obedience upward of twenty years, and have been blessed with many children by you. If in the course and process of this time you can report and prove it too, against mine honor aught, my bond to wedlock or my love and duty against your sacred person, in God's name turn me away and let the foulest contempt shut door upon me, and so give me up to the sharpest kind of justice. Please you, sir, the king your father was reputed for a prince most prudent, of an excellent and unmatched wit and judgment. Ferdinand, my father, king of Spain, was reckoned one the wisest prince that there had reigned for many a year before. It is not to be questioned that they had gathered a wise counsel to them of every realm that did debate this business, who deemed our marriage lawful. Wherefore I humbly beseech you, sir, to spare me till I may be by my friends in Spain advised, whose counsel I will implore. If not, in the name of God, your pleasure be fulfilled. Man, this plea is, like, so intense. He, she, she lays everything out for him. She has lived exactly as she ought. And here she is in a country that's not her own. It is her own because she's queen of it, but before this, she was from Spain. And so, she has no one to defend her here. Everyone here is siding with the king and is in the control of Cardinal Wolsey. And she sees that very clearly. So she asks that me, she may get some advice from her family back in Spain. But Wolsey is like, oh no, you know, we are here to help you. Us wise churchmen are here to, to guide you. And Catherine turns on him and has another great speech to him. She says, sir, 
I am about to weep, but thinking that we are a queen, or long have dreamed so, certain, the daughter of a king, my drops of tears I'll turn to sparks of fire. <laughs> That's great. And then a moment later she says, uh, he, he asks her to be patient, and she says, I will, when you are humble, nay, before, or God will punish me. I do believe, induced by potent circumstances, that you are mine enemy, and make my challenge, you shall not be my judge, for it is you have blown this coal betwixt my lord and me, which gods do quench. Therefore I say again, I utterly abhor, yea, from my soul refuse you for my judge, whom yet once more I hold my most malicious foe, and think not at all a friend to truth. So she knows she cannot be judged by Cardinal Woolsey because all he wants is to destroy her for his own personal benefit. And so she says, no, I won't accept you as my judge. She turns instead to the Pope for help. And the king is really impressed with his wife here. And for a moment, the, the haze of Anne Boleyn fades. And he's like, wow, she is a really good woman. And everything she says is perfectly fair here. And he does attempt to clear the name of Cardinal Wolsey, but he also recognizes that all these churchmen are manipulating the situation. I may perceive these cardinals trifle with me. And so he decides that he's not going to put his faith in all these churchmen anymore. He's going to make his own decisions. Of course, his decision is not to keep Catherine, who's amazing, but rather to turn to the pretty young Anne Boleyn. Jerk. Act 3. We see Catherine, who is with her ladies, and she is grieving. She's listening to music, and she is trying to deal with everything that's going on. But she is friendless and harried by all these people who are trying to destroy her. And much like Buckingham at the beginning, we have all kinds of sympathy for her here. And so Woolsey and Compeius come in and they try to talk her into accepting their will rather than waiting for help from Spain. And she contests them for a while, but she's ultimately powerless against them. And so we see her fall here. And she's going to be put to the side as Princess Dowager. In scene two, however, we see the destruction of Cardinal Wolsey. Several of the courtiers are talking about what has happened recently. Wolsey doesn't realize it, but not historically accurately, but according to the play, he has accidentally slipped some of his papers into a packet that was sent to the king. In it, he revealed how much he was going behind the king's back and manipulating things with the Pope, and also how much he had grifted off of his position. And Wolsey comes in trying to figure out how he's going to do things. He doesn't want the king to marry Anne Boleyn, and he sees the king's affection that way. And he's hoping that he can manipulate the king into marrying the French princess. However, he doesn't yet realize that he has cooked his own goose. And some of the courtiers are watching him as he hums and haws, and they are enjoying the moment of his ultimate destruction here. The king then comes in and sits down to speak to Wolsey. And he sees how Wolsey is, is deep in thought. Of course, Wolsey is deep in thought on all of his evil machinations. But the king says, Good my lord, you are full of heavenly stuff and bear the inventory of your best graces in your mind, the which you are now running o'er. You have scarce time to steal from the spiritual leisure a brief span to keep your earthly audit. Sure, in that I deem you an ill husband, and I'm glad to have you therein my companion. Man, the, the, the speech is just dripping with all of these references to... Woolsey's accounts, even though it's supposedly about all the spiritual things that Woolsey is thinking about. Instead, he's referencing all the ways that he's stolen from him, how he has basically just funneled all of this money into his own uh, personal gain. And Woolsey's like, oh yes, yes, I, I have time to talk to you, of course. And the king hands him the paper, which uh, reveals that he knows about all of his expenditures and also knows about all of his manipulation and all of the ways that he was trying to use the king. Then, sent from the king, several of the courtiers, Surrey and Norfolk and Suffolk, come in to demand the seal from the cardinal, which he refuses to give them. And then they uh, lay out for him how very, very much in trouble he is, all of the accusations against him. And although he tries to brush it away and deny it, 
everyone knows he's doomed at this point. And so as they all leave, then he has this moment of introspection and recognizes his fault. And finally, we actually see him have a recognition of the error of his ways. And then Cromwell, his servant, comes in and he addresses Cromwell and there's a moment where he becomes a bit more sympathetic. He's clearly been an evil, devious man this entire play, but in recognizing his faults and finally being caught for them, it gives him an opportunity to repent and change his heart and recognize his, his, his ills. And he offers uh, Cromwell some advice on how not to be swept up in these political games and in, in a quest for power. Of course, Cromwell is going to be historically important later on and is going to be uh, causing other trouble, including ultimately accusing Anne Boleyn um, and getting her beheaded. Of course, that's not part of this play, but uh, more history coming up. So I guess the Cardinal finally does get back at Anne Boleyn through his servant Cromwell. Cromwell also gives him the news of who all is replacing him, and how Sir Thomas More is chosen as Lord Chancellor. Wolsey says about him, He's a learned man. May he continue long in his highness's favor, and do justice for truth's sake, and his conscience, that his bones, when he has run his course and sleeps in his blessings, may have a tomb of orphan's tears wept on him. That's such a, an interesting statement because in almost no time, Sir Thomas More is going to be accused of treason and executed because he cannot in good conscience accept the divorce of the king. All of that, of course, is in the play Sir Thomas More, which is another great one. And if you'd like to watch my notes over that, those are also available. I'll put them in the card and also link them at the end. Cromwell also reveals that the king has actually already married Anne Boleyn in secret. Yeah, he moves pretty fast. And Wolsey realizes that was ultimately what doomed him. And he has this emotional final speech where he tells Cromwell not to seek ambition. The end of Act 3. We move to Act 4, and we start Act 4 with a rather dramatic procession and coronation of Anne. It's grandiose and ceremonial, and historically it was, I think, the moment that the globe got burned down, thanks to one of the cannons. In scene two, we see the, the Princess Dowager Catherine, no longer the Queen, and she is on her deathbed now, and she's being attended by Griffith, who tells her of the death of Wolsey, and helps her to be able to forgive the horrible Woolsey. And Catherine, who we've loved throughout this entire thing, um, is almost moved to sainthood at this point. She has forgiven people out of the generosity of her heart. She also has this dream that she's being carried up to paradise. And so we see her end, just like we saw the end of Woolsey and of Buckingham. She hopes that the king will do right by her ladies and also by her daughter Mary. Again, Knowing history, we see some interesting, almost ironic implications in the future. But we get the penitent death of Wolsey as well as the death of Catherine. Act 5. In Act 5, Scene 1, we see Cranmer, who is the new Archbishop of Canterbury. And there is a bit of an attack against him because of his religious beliefs. We see the shift from Catholicism to Protestantism, hinted at in here. But although Cranmer is being accused by several of his religious brethren, he has tried to deal with the problem on his own and not seek for help from the king. The king, however, goes to him, tells him that he is in danger of being locked up. But when he sees the sincerity of Cranmer, he offers him his support and ultimately gives him his signet ring as a symbol of protection in case the Privy Council tries to do anything to him. The king is then told by the old lady that his wife, Anne Boleyn, has given birth, and he's very excited, uh, but it's not a son. However, the king runs to be with her. In scene two, we see Cranmer facing the Privy Council. First, he is kept waiting in the hall while they discuss him, and then he is called in and abused by all of them. The king sees what's going on, but he watches to see how things will turn out. And the council tells him that they are going to lock him up in the tower. But when they try to drag him away, he pulls out the king's ring and shows it to them as a symbol that he has the king's favor. And they all realize they've made a big mistake. 
At this point, the king comes in and tells them all to love Cranmer and to offer him their friendship, and that it was wrong of them to treat him so disrespectfully. They all have to humbly turn and apologize to him and offer their love to him at that point. And then the king turns to Cranmer and says, Hey, I have a new daughter and you need to be her godfather and baptizer, so come on over! In scene three, the people at the door are trying to hold back this massive crowd that's all excited to see the new baby, the princess. And finally, we come to the end, which is a big ceremonial christening. And the baby is named Elizabeth. And Cranmer has this prophetic vision where he sees Elizabeth's future. And it is this big, long love prophecy to Queen Elizabeth and how much she's going to bless England and even King James coming after her will bless England. And so it's this big, like, love song to the monarchy. And so, ah, Queen Elizabeth. Interesting stuff. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or watch another video. And I'd love for you to join me over on Patreon where I have lots of resources for you and continue to add more. So until next time. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.